us. Hey, why don't the rest of us, why don't we stand, reach across the aisles, and then greet somebody, meet somebody new, and then we'll return right back to our seats. Good to see you here in the house of the Lord. Well, good morning. It's so good to see you here this morning. Open up your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians. Turn to chapter 5, and I'm going to be reading out of verse 15 through verse 17, and I'm going to be addressing the topic of this year, the theme, Leveling Up in Time Management. Actually, first, isn't there a video for this? Let's watch that video, please. This year, the Victory Church family will be embarking on a spiritual journey in which we will encourage one another to level up. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 through 3 reads, So let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead, or in my words, let us level up instead, and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. You don't need further instructions about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And so, God willing, we will move forward, we will level up to further understanding. That's what it says in Hebrews. So throughout the year, we're going to be drawing on Dallas Willard's book, The Spirit of the Disciplines, Understanding How God Changes Life, and John Orpork's devotional, At Home with the Father. We will level up in our knowledge and relationship with God. We will level up in our knowledge and relationship with one another. And we will level up in our relationship with our own inner being. When Christ is released to do his will in us, we simply view ourselves as empowered and fruitful members of the kingdom of God. Jesus says this, I see what the Father does and I do it. He also said, I hear from the Father, speak and I speak it. Jesus declared that he knows the Father and the Father knows the Son. Then Jesus makes this profound statement like, I'm the firstborn of many brethren, referring that you and I are his brethren. Then in John chapter 17, 22, Jesus has a conversation with the Father and he says, I have given them the glory that you gave to me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you have loved them as much as you have loved me. Father, I want these whom you have given to me to be with me where I am, that they can see all the glory you have given me because you loved me even before the world began. So this teaches us that Jesus wants us to be at home with him, first here on earth and later with him in heaven. And this is accomplished by exercising the same disciplines that Jesus exercised. So we will study the epistle of James, we'll study the spirit of the disciplines, and as we level up in our understanding of his work, in our relationship with him, with each other, and with ourselves, by the end of 2024, we will feel very much at home with the Father. So I challenge you, I encourage you to level up with us in the year 2024. So I want to kick off the year, this first Sunday of the month of January, by talking about leveling up in time management. There was this yuppie who had worked all of his life and had a great deal of money, and he went down to the local BMW car dealership, and he wanted to buy the fanciest car that his money could buy, the best car that BMW made. 
And right there sitting on the showroom was this beautiful four-door sedan BMW. He walked around it a few times, opened up the door, smelt the new smell, looked at the leather, all of that. And he agrees to buy it. He buys it and he goes out and he's driving around town. He's just enjoying the sights of the inside and looking outside and he's just loving his BMW. And after driving for about an hour, he says, you know, I want to look at the outside of it again. And he pulls off and parks right next to the sidewalk and he opens up his door. And right as he opens up the door, a car comes by, hits the door, drags the door off, and the car doesn't even stop. He calls the cops. The cops come. They're taking out a report. And the entire time that the cop has taken the report, he's belly aching. Oh, my BMW and all this money that I paid for it, and I can't believe it. And the guy never even stopped. And he goes on and on. And, just, and, the, and the officer is trying to get some, some answers. And, and, and finally, the officer is exasperated. He says, you yuppies, all you ever worry about is these earthly material goods. You didn't even notice that when he took the, the door off of your car, he took hit your arm with it. And he looks at his shoulder and sure enough, then he looks at the cop, and he looks at his shoulder, looks at the cop, looks at the shoulder. He begins to cry. He says, my Rolex, my Rolex, what happened to my Rolex? I'd say he's got a problem, focusing on the wrong thing. Time, time, seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, years. Time, a lifetime, a long life, a life cut short, an eternity, an eternity in heaven with God, an eternity away from God in the torments of hell. Many philosophers and theologians and God-fearing men and women have pondered this word time. It's an interesting word, time. King David pondered time as he penned in Psalms chapter 90, verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. The apostle Paul pondered the subject of time when he admonished the Ephesians, the Ephesian church in chapter 5 and verse 15. He says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, he says, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Wisdom, time, evil days, God's will, time, my time, my life, his will. Is it possible that my time in my life can actually accomplish his will? St. Thomas I'm sorry, St. Saint, uh, Saint, uh, Augustine in the year 430 A.D. pondered the subject of time and no a post-biblical church father has given us more on the subject of time and meaning of time. But he wrote this, he says, everyone knows what time is until they try to define it. Time is difficult to define, no, no words can accurately describe it. Augustine pondered time and he concluded that time was actually a gift from God to us humans. He pondered that, um, as he wrote, that from God's perspective, God being immutable in his essence and unmovable in his being had no need for time before the creation of the world. That's why we say that God was outside of time. There was no time. But, but because of the sin of man in the Garden of Eden... And because God saw that they had fallen, taken from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God kicked them out of the garden, separated them from the tree of life that would give them eternity here on earth. So this world, however, has been corrupted by the sin of man, and time serves one purpose only, according to Augustine, and that is to provoke change. So time was and is the tool that God has given humans to bring about change in this world. We need to ponder that. Think about that. Is this true? Is time a gift from God to bring about change? Change from this mortality to the immortality. And even during our mortality, is there need to bring about a change? So our, uh, Augustine argued that if time is given to bring about change, then the simplest form of knowing God's will is to know what things, first of all, in our own lives need to be changed. I'm a sinner. 
And that needs to change. I need to ask God forgiveness of my sins. I need his spirit to come inside of me. That's the first thing that needs to change. Then I need to change the way I influence the world around me, my spouse and my children. So the, the, the most basic form of knowing God's will is asking the question, what needs to change? Are there any scriptures that might actually support this particular notion? I believe that there are. First of all, the key verse that I just gave, let's read it again with this idea. If Augustine is right, and the time is given as a gift to humanity to bring about change, and now we read what Paul is writing, let's read that again. He says, look carefully then how you walk. What change needs to take place as you're walking this world, as unwise people, we now become wise, making the best use of our time because the days are evil. We identify that there are things that need to change. The days are evil, so we need to make the best of our time. And to really make the change that needs to happen, we need to understand what the will of the Lord really is. I think Augustine was right. I think that time is a gift to us humans, and therefore, we need to use that time to bring about the change that needs to happen. But every generation has a different problem statement because the world around us is changing. Some have improved the life and given us a better life than what they had, and maybe we can pass on even a better life than them. Are there any other scriptures that support this argument? I think so. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. It says, from the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives, and all of these men understood the signs of the time, and they knew the best course for Israel to take. Somebody once asked me, Pastor, if you could have the perfect church, what would it be? I said, it would be a church filled with people, 200 leaders that understood the times that we were living in, and knew exactly what it is that we needed to do to please the Lord, to fulfill God's will in our lifetime. David, Paul, Augustine were all, uh, they're not alone in their quest on this issue of time. There were men back in the 1700s, people like Jonathan Edwards, along with John Wesley and George Whitfield, men who understood the times in which they lived, and they committed their lives their lifetime to usher in the greatest spiritual revival that has ever taken place in the Americas, and we call it today the Great Awakening, which took place between 1730 and it ran all the way up until mid-1740s. Now, I need you to understand this. 1730, 1740s, our nation was formed on July the 4th of 1776. Why would God bring about such a great spiritual awakening in the 1730s and the 1740s? Why would God use these men born in 1709, Jonathan Edwards, along with John Wesley and George Whitfield, for the following reason? The spiritual awakening would ultimately influence the thinking of the founding fathers of this nation, who on the very day that our nation was formed, July the 4th, 1776, and just prior to each of those men signing the Declaration of Independence, the Founding Fathers bent their knees and prayed. And today, almost 250 years later, what these great revivalists did after understanding the will of God for their lifetime, coupled with a personal commitment to use their time to accomplish God's will, have afforded us the freedom that we today have. 250 years after the Great Awakening and the Founding Fathers. Did you know that George Whitfield? personally witnessed to George Washington, who was a skeptic. And George Washington built a very large auditorium so that George Whitfield, the cross-eyed preacher, he had one eye that basically uh, turned inward, and he was called the cross-eyed preacher. And George Whitfield was able to bring the characters within the Bible alive. In fact, he, he preached, uh, he's not my topic today, but George Whitfield, he, he, he preached in Boston. And he was so powerful in his preaching that more people than lived in Boston came to hear him preach in Boston. That particular series of, of services, uh, Boston was so overflowing with people that all the hotels and restaurants and everything was just basically overloaded. Why? Because these three men, Jonathan Edwards, John Wesley, and George Whitfield, they, they understood the time in which they were living. And I am certain of this one thing, that what God did in the 1730s all the way through mid-1740s, if it was done then, it can be done again. 
if you and I will commit our time to the Lord's will, if we ask Him what needs to change in our lifetime, and we commit ourselves to that very goal. This issue of time, it it just absolutely captured Jonathan Edwards' mind. When he was 13 years old, Yale School of Divinity was a boarding school. He went to Yale at the age of 13. He graduated at the age of 17 with his Master's of Divinity. This was 1720. Shortly after he graduated, he was asked to pastor a church in New York right down the street from what today is the New York Stock Exchange. But while he was still at Yale, at the age of 17, Jonathan Edwards began to write what is today known as the Jonathan Edwards 70 Resolutions. He took biblical principles and he applied them to his heart. And back then he would say, Uh, presupposing that, uh, of course, today we would say it's resolution. He didn't use the word resolution. He used the word uh, preposition or presupposing that. But he wrote these 70 resolutions. You can Google it. It's, It's absolutely powerful. And the first four of these resolutions that he wrote, things that he pulled from Scripture, was the absolute identity of who God was. He recognized that God was sovereign and creator of the entire universe. And the first four of his resolutions is, I'm going to serve him. My entire life will be dedicated to serving him. And then his fifth resolution, which is what I want to focus on a little bit today, is this. Never lose, he said to himself, I am resolved never lose one moment of time, but seize the time to use it in the most profitable way I possibly can. It was in the year 1734, Jonathan Edwards had preached before a very, very large crowd. You can see a picture here. It's a rendition of that. He had preached two sermons in a row in November on justification by faith. Hundreds came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now what? So in December of the the same year, uh, December of 1734, he preached a sermon titled The Preciousness of Time. And out of his sermon, I've drawn some of the ideas that I'm going to present to you today. A little bit of a recap of his sermon given in 1734. In his sermon, he invited the listening audience to go with him to the bedchambers of a dying man. And he posed to the audience, what do you think is on his mind? Do you think he's thinking about how to make more money or what business venture he might engage in or what piece of land he might buy? No, there's only but one thing that is on his mind, and it is time. What will it be like on that moment of time when I pass from this life on this bed to the life to come? Or he might be thinking what he wouldn't give to have but one moment of time to do over again some of the things that he had done wrong in the lifetime that he lived. Then Jonathan Edwards invites the listening audience to from a distance go to the pit of hell and look down into the people who are in torment throughout all eternity. And he poses the question, what do you think is on their mind? They are thinking but of one thing, how incredibly long this time of torment will be for them throughout all eternity separated from God. And they're thinking about what they would not give to have one moment of time in this life that they could make things right with God, that they not spend the rest of their eternity in that place. Jonathan Edwards conveyed to the people that we must make the absolute best of our time. Time is precious. The preciousness of time. He put out this point, happy or miserable, he said, eternity depends on the good or ill improvement of it. And I quote, eternity depends on the improvement of time, but when once time of life is gone, when once death has come, we have no more to do with time. There is no possibility to obtain the restoration of it or another space in which to prepare for eternity. In other words, he says, we've got to get it right in this lifetime, because what we do with our time here on earth has everything to do with the quality of life that we will have in the the rest of eternity. What we do here in this life will echo throughout eternity. And he argued time is short. Again, once time is gone, it's gone forever. No pains, no costs will recover it. 
He said, we are uncertain of its continuance. We are not guaranteed a tomorrow. We may die tomorrow. We may live. We don't know. We have no guarantee of the continuation of this life. Therefore, we must carpe diem. We must seize the day today to do what God is calling us to do. And he argued when it is past, it cannot be recovered. In his sermon, he says, you may have health and lose health and regain health again. You may have wealth and lose your wealth and regain wealth again. But this item of time, time once it is lost, it can never again be recovered. Many years later in 1889, Charles Spurgeon, he says, serve God by doing common actions in a heavenly spirit. In other words, everything that you do, do in a heavenly spirit, thinking God, what I do, let it bring about a change. And then if your daily calling only leaves you cracks and crevices of time, fill them up with godly service. Rick Warren, a modern preacher, Saddleback Church, says time is our most precious gift because you only have a set amount of it. And sadly, some should be worried about how they have spent their time. They spent their time in idleness. They spent their time doing wicked things, not changing things to the good, but quite opposite, hurting people around them. Some have spent their time in worldly pursuits while neglecting their souls. Jonathan Edwards, he says this, how little is the preciousness of time considered and how little sense of it do the greater part of mankind seem to have. And to how little good purpose do many spend their time? There is nothing more precious than time, and yet nothing of which men are more prodigal. Jonathan Edwards, he understood. And and he started so young at the age of 13, and he committed himself that while he was alive, he was going to serve the Lord. Allow me to introduce you to a man by the name of Tristan Harris. He is a former former Google uh, design ethetician. Uh, He resigned from Google, and he founded the Center for Human Technology. His organizational goal is to align the technology to our humanity. I didn't realize this until I read the article, but apparently Google, Apple, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of the live streams like Netflix and Prime uh, Video, all of them have behind-the-scenes algorithms that are being written and constantly updated. And here's how it works. That basically... Whatever video you're looking at, if you're looking at cars, like in my case, I like looking at a car, it's amazing how the little video feeds, I keep getting a whole bunch of feeds about cars. And it's not long before one of the car makers want to introduce to me the option of buying one of their cars. And the way this all works is that the more I look at a screen, they're measuring how many seconds I'm looking at a particular picture or a particular video. And if I stop and look at a picture for a couple of seconds, that tells the algorithm that I'm interested in this product. And so Tristan understood that while this was important for, I guess, marketers, direct marketers to understand what it is that the the consumers were consuming and the algorithms were becoming more and more and more targeting of a person based upon what they were actually looking at, the question was, is this an infringement on people's privacy? Because these big companies would turn around and sell this information to marketers who wanted you to become the consumer. And Tristan says it's fine with adults. Adults know what they're doing. But now the algorithms were directing or affecting children. And so children would be looking at bicycles. And next thing they're looking at people doing tricks on their bicycles. And next thing you see people jumping off of mountains in their bicycles. And this was causing harm to kids. And kids were becoming so affixed. to to the screens of their cell phones that even though mom would say, put it away, go to bed, they would find them underneath the blankets playing with their cell phones way into the hour of the night because they were basically being programmed with the algorithm to look at certain things. And Tristan says this simply should not be. So he left Google and he formed, again, this organization called the Center for Human Technology. And uh, it wasn't long after that he formed a movement called Time well spent. This was in 2016. And it moved so fastly as he was informing parents that this was in January of 2016. By June of 2016, every one of the big companies, Google, Apple, Facebook, Twitter, all of them agreed that they would write algorithm modifications that if it was discovered that it was a child looking at certain things, that they would only feed maybe three or four things to that child. 
and then it would be up to the child's discretion if they would jump around or not. It worked. Tristan, he saw a problem, and he committed his life to solving it. Why would I bring up a non-believer into this particular issue? Can I tell you why? Because Jesus himself actually addresses this issue when he tells the story of an unjust steward. Let me tell you about that story real quick. There was a man who was being accused of mismanagement of his master's wealth. So he was going to give accounts, and this man, according to Luke chapter 16, this man knew that he was going to be basically fired. So he goes to all of the people that owns his master money. And he says, how much do you own? Cut that debt in half. And how much do you own? Cut that debt in half. When the master found out about it in Luke chapter 16, Jesus telling this parable says the master commended the unjust steward for acting shrewdly. Then Jesus makes a powerful statement in Luke chapter 16, verse 8. Let me read it to you. It says, for the sons of this world are more shrewd. The sons of this world are more shrewd in the dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And Jesus talking to his disciples, I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth. Make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. I want to tell you something. If the Christians will not wake up to the idea that we need to use our time, our energies, and our resources to take this world from where it is to where it needs to be, he will call on people like King Nebuchadnezzar, who was not a believer in God, to do exactly what God needs to have done in this earth. But he will hold us accountable for not doing it. So what is the point of all of this that God has called us, you and I? He called Jonathan Edwards and John Wesley and George Wycliffe to bring about the revival called the Great Awakening that would shape the consciousness of people like George Washington, that they would bend their knee and that they would write the Declaration of Independence, that today, 250 years later, we're able to enjoy the spiritual freedoms that we have today. So what's the next great revival that this nation is needing? It depends on you and I to wake up to the notion that I have one life, I've been born, and one day I will die, and I need to do the same thing Jonathan Edwards did. I will commit my life to ask God, God, what one problem needs to be addressed in my lifetime that I can be a contributor to that, that when I pass off of the scene, the world that is yet to happen will be a better place for my children than it is for me today. And if it happened in the 1730s, it can happen today. So we must, we must in this year 2024, as we're leveling up in every area, the disciplines of Christ, we're going to appropriate them to ourselves. What Christ did, we want to do. And it starts with time. We level up our time management. Jonathan Edwards says, you are accountable to God for your time. And I know that you and I know this. We're accountable to God for our time. And Jonathan Edwards says, please consider how much time you have already wasted, how much time you have already lost. The use of time has always been an issue for King David, for the Apostle Paul, for Augustine, for Edwards, for Spurgeon, for all of these men, all the way through the 1970s. Listen, even in the 1970s, a non-believer wrote a song, and it was at the top of the charts through 1973, through 1974, it was one of the top 10 most played songs in the radio. 1973 and 1974, you'll be surprised by this. It's a folk song called Cats in the Cradle. It was written by Sandra Chapin, and she passed it on to her husband, Harry Chapin, who put it to song. And I want to read the lyrics. My child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way, but there were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned how to walk while I was away. And he wasn't talking, for I knew it. And as he grew, he'd said, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know I'm going to be like you. My son turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball, Dad. Come let us play. Can you teach me to throw? I said, not today. I got a lot to do. He said, that's okay. 
And as he walked away, but his smile never dimmed and said, I'm going to be like him. Yeah, you know, I'm going to be like him. Well, he came from college just the other day, so much like a man I just had to say, son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? He shook his head and he said with a smile, what I'd really like, dad, is to borrow the car keys. See you later. Can I have them, please? And the chorus goes, and the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you're coming home, son, I don't know when, but we'll get together then, dad. You know we'll have a good time then. I've long since retired. My son's moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if you could find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle and the kids got the flu, but it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. It's been sure nice talking to you. And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he's grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. And then the chorus repeats itself, and the cats of the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you're coming home, son, I don't know when, but we'll get together then, Dad. We're going to have a good time then. There was a great loneliness that took place in the, seven, uh, in the uh, 70s, even through the 80s, where the shift in our mental consciousness was about making wealth and money and all these other things. Now hear me, Jesus said, the people of this world are wiser and they're dealing with their own kind. You, you need to read that, Luke 16. And he says, yes, make for yourself friends with unrighteous mammon. You have, you have to earn an income. And there's no condemnation for you hardworking folks. I'm so proud of the hardworking folks. But I want you to understand something. If we don't like the millennials of today, we need to ask ourselves, what was a popular song in the, 17, in the 1970s? They shaped a generation. And today people are saying, I, I don't want to work like mom and dad did. I want to have time with my kids and I, I want to establish a family. I want things to be different. And we may have a really hard time with this. Let me tell you something. Did you know that the great revival of the 1730s and the 1740s created a problem? It was about to divide Yale in half. Because as this revival was taking place, the reports that were coming out was that as people were receiving Christ, that they would fall to the ground and faint. We would call it being slain in the spirit. And they started talking all kinds of gibberish is what the report said. They, they would say all kinds of weird things. And then they would start shaking and quaking. And that's what the Quaker movement started to say. So the faculty at Yale began to say, this is not a move of God. This is all emotionalism. And these preachers like John Wesley and these preachers like, uh, like uh, Whitfield, they're, they're so passionately preaching that these, these are not real conversions. These are all emotional hypes. And Jonathan Edwards, hear me, was asked to preach at the commencement of that particular year of the, of the year, of the, the school, the academic year. The faculty was about to, sh to, to split the school. Yale almost ceased to exist. And Jonathan Edwards preached a passionate message about understanding what God is doing. The sometimes when God has a mighty move of God, yes, there's, there's things that happen, the devil may attack. But ultimately what God is trying to do, this is what Jonathan Edwards says, is he's trying to bring the next generation. What does this generation need to bring about the change that is needed to make the world a better place than what they found? And that preserved Yale that particular year because all of them agreed Hear me, and this was before the signing of the Declaration of Independence. All of them agreed that what they needed to do is allow religious freedom, which became one of the primary ideas of the Bill of Rights of the United States, the freedom of religion. And it was Jonathan Edwards preaching before the student body and the faculty of Yale that brought this about. Men who understood the times that they're living in and dedicated their lives to doing what God had called them to do, were able to effect a change. So let's ask this one question. What does God still need us to do in the year 2024 and whatever years beyond we have here of life? What is it that God wants to change if Augustine is right? If time was given exclusively to humans for the purpose of change, what problem needs to be addressed? 
What problem needs our attention today? What happened in 1730s and 1740s can and should happen again. We should usher in a spiritual awakening. Our life, our time, coupled with God's will, is the truest definition of leveling up in our time management. So here's the conclusion. Life is short. Death is certain. And eternity is a very very long time. Level up your time management and rejoice that what you do here on earth with your time will echo throughout eternity. Will you bow your heads with me as we pray? In my case, Lord, I was born in 1965. Like Jonathan Edwards, I look back and I ponder how much of my time has been wasted. So I heed to the words of Paul to the Ephesian church. Lord, I need wisdom because the days that we live in are evil. So I need to, Lord, consider my days like King David did. Lord, help me to count my days. And like all of these men, Spurgeon and all of these men throughout history, we have but one life to live. What will our life be? What change instruments will we be with the time you gave us? So, Lord, I don't know when my expiration date will be. I don't know how much longer you'll allow me to be here on this earth, nor do any of us in this room do. But, Lord, we do know for sure we want the world to be a better place than it is today. And, Lord, we know that perilous times are coming, and maybe it's just preparing the next generation to face the challenges that they're going to face. Equip them to face those challenges. Well, Lord, I don't know how to do that. Nobody in this room really knows how to do that. So, Lord, we need your wisdom. So, Lord, we thank you for what Paul wrote to the Ephesian church. Lord, give us wisdom to know your will, to walk wisely in the days of evil. Help us, Lord, to plant in our children, our grandchildren, the seeds that will give them a hope for tomorrow. This is really what we're praying for. Help us to be better managers of our time. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And everybody says, amen. Did you get something out of this?